Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Recorded by Mill Nicholson Chapter 24 Treats on a very poor subject, but is a short one, and may be found of importance in this history. It was no unfit messenger of death who had disturbed the quiet of the matron's room. Her body was bent by age, her limbs trembled with palsy, her face, distorted into a mumbling leer, resembled more the grotesque shaping of some wild pencil than the work of nature's hand. Alas! How few of nature's faces are left alone to gladden us with their beauty! The cares and sorrows and hungerings of the world change them as they change hearts, and it is only when those passions sleep and have lost their hold for ever that the troubled clouds pass off and leave heaven's surface clear. It is a common thing for the countenances of the dead, even in that fixed and rigid state, to subside into the long-forgotten expression of sleeping infancy and settle into the very look of early life. So calm, so peaceful, do they grow again, that those who knew them in their happy childhood kneel by the coffin's side in awe, and see the angel even upon earth. The old crone tottered along the passages and up the stairs, muttering some indistinct answers to the chiding of her companion. Being at length compelled to pause for breath, she gave the light into her hand, and remained behind to follow as she might while the more nimble superior made her way to the room where the sick woman lay. It was a bare garret-room, with a dim light burning at the farther end. There was another old woman watching by the bed. The parish apothecary's apprentice was standing by the fire, making a toothpick out of a quill. "'Cold night, Mrs. Corney,' said this young gentleman, as the matron entered. "'Very cold indeed, sir,' replied the mistress in her most civil tones and dropping a curtsey as she spoke. "'You should get better coals out of your contractors,' said the apothecary's deputy, breaking a lump on the top of the fire with a rusty poker. "'These are not at all the sort of thing for a cold night.' "'They're the port's choosing, sir,' returned the matron. "'The least they could do would be to keep us pretty warm, for our places are hard enough.' The conversation was here interrupted by a moan from the sick woman. "'Oh,' said the young man turning his face towards the bed, as if he had previously quite forgotten the patient. "'It's all U.P. there, Mrs. Corney.' "'It is, is it, sir?' asked the matron. "'If she lasts a couple of hours, I shall be surprised,' said the apothecary's apprentice, intent upon the toothpick's point. "'It's a break-up of the system altogether. Is she dozing, old lady?' The attendant stooped over the bed to ascertain, and nodded in the affirmative. "'Then perhaps she'll go off in that way, if you don't make a row,' said the young man. "'Put the light on the floor. She won't see it there.' The attendant did as she was told, shaking her head meanwhile, to intimate that the woman would not die so easily. Having done so, she resumed her seat by the side of the other nurse, who had by this time returned. The mistress, with an expression of impatience, wrapped herself in her shawl, and sat at the foot of the bed. The apothecary's apprentice— Having completed the manufacture of the toothpick, planted himself in front of the fire, and made good use of it, for ten minutes or so. When apparently growing rather dull, he wished Mrs. Corney joy of her job, and took himself off on tiptoe. When they had sat in silence for some time, the two old women rose from the bed, and crouching over the fire, held out their withered hands to catch the heat. The flame threw a ghastly light on their shrivelled faces, and made their ugliness appear terrible, as, in this position, they began to converse in a low voice. "'Did she say any more, Annie, dear, while I was gone?' inquired the messenger. "'Not a word,' replied the other. "'She plucked and tore at her arms for a little time, but I held her hands, and she soon dropped off. She hasn't much strength in her, so I easily kept her quiet. I ain't so weak for an old woman, although I am on parish allowance. No, no. Did she drink the hot wine the doctor said she was to have? demanded the first. I tried to get it down, rejoined the other, but her teeth were tight set, and she clenched the mug so hard that it was as much as I could do to get it back again. So I drank it, and it did me good. Looking cautiously round, to ascertain that they were not overheard, the two hags cowered nearer to the fire, 
and chuckled heartily. "'I mind the time,' said the first speaker, "'when she would have done the same, and made rare fun of it afterwards.' "'Aye, that she would,' rejoined the other. "'She had a merry heart. A many, many beautiful corpses she laid out, as nice and neat as waxwork. My old eyes have seen them, aye, and those old hands touched them too, for I have helped her scores of times." Stretching forth her trembling fingers as she spoke, the old creature shook them exultingly before her face, and fumbling in her pocket brought out an old-time discoloured tin snuff-box, from which she shook a few grains into the outstretched palm of her companion, and a few more into her own. While they were thus employed, the matron, who had been impatiently watching until the dying woman should awaken from her stupor, joined them by the fire, and sharply asked how long she was to wait. "'Not long, mistress,' replied the second woman, looking up into her face. "'We have none of us long to wait for death. Patience, patience. He'll be here soon enough for us all.' "'Hold your tongue, you doting idiot!' said the matron sternly. "'You, Martha, tell me, has she been in this way before?' "'Often,' answered the first woman. "'But will never be again,' added the second one. "'That is, she'll never wake again but once. And mind, mistress, that won't be for long.' "'Long or short,' said the matron snappishly, "'she won't find me here when she does wake. Take care, both of you.' How you worry me again for nothing! It's no part of my duty to see all the old women in the house die, and I won't. That's more. Mind that, you impudent old harridans. If you make a fool of me again, I'll soon cure you, I warrant you." She was bouncing away, when a cry from the two women, who had turned towards the bed, caused her to look round. The patient had raised herself upright, and was stretching her arms towards them. Who's that? she cried in a hollow voice. Hush, hush, said one of the women, stooping over. Lie down, lie down. I'll never lie down again, alive, said the woman, struggling. I will tell her. Come here, nearer. Let me whisper in your ear." She clutched the matron by the arm, and forcing her into a chair by the bedside, was about to speak, when looking round, she caught sight of the two old women bending forward in the attitude of eager listeners. "'Turn them away,' said the woman drowsily. "'Make haste! Make haste!' The two old crones, chiming in together, began pouring out many piteous lamentations, that the poor dear was too far gone to know her best friends, and were uttering sundry protestations that they would never leave her, when the superior pushed them from the room, closed the door, and returned to the bedside. On being excluded, the old ladies changed their tone, and cried through the keyhole that old Sally was drunk, which, indeed, was not unlikely, since, in addition to a moderate dose of opium, prescribed by the apothecary, she was labouring under the effects of a final taste of gin and water, which had been privily administered, in the openness of their hearts, by the worthy old ladies themselves. "'Now, listen to me,' said the dying woman aloud, as if making a great effort to revive one latent spark of energy. "'In this very room, in this very bed, I once nursed a pretty young creature that was brought into the house, with her feet cut and bruised with walking, and all soiled with dust and blood. She gave birth to a boy, and died. Let me think. What was the year again?" "'Never mind the year,' said the impatient auditor. "'What about her?' "'I,' murmured the sick woman, relapsing into a former drowsy state. "'What about her? What about? I know," she cried, jumping fiercely up, her face flushed and her eyes starting from her head. I robbed her. So I did. She wasn't cold. I tell you, she wasn't cold. 
when I stole it. Stole what, for God's sake? cried the matron with a gesture as if she would call for help. It, replied the woman, laying her hand over the other's mouth, the only thing she had. She wanted clothes to keep her warm and food to eat. But she had kept it safe and had it in her bosom. It was gold, I tell you, rich gold that might have saved her life. Gold? echoed the matron, bending eagerly over the woman as she fell back. Go on, go on. Yes, what of it? Who was her mother? When was it? She charged me to keep it safe, replied the woman with a groan, and trusted me as the only woman about her. I stole it in my heart when she first showed it me, hanging around her neck, and the child's death, perhaps, is on me besides. They would have treated him better if they had known it all. Known what? asked the other. Speak. The boy grew so like his mother, said the woman, rambling on, and not heeding the question, that I could never forget it when I saw his face. Oh, poor girl, poor girl, she was so young, too. Such a gentle lamb. Wait, there's more to tell. I've not told you all, have I? No, no, replied the matron, inclining her head to catch the words, as they came more faintly from the dying woman. Be quick, or it may be too late. The mother, said the woman, making a more violent effort than before, the mother, when the pains of death first came upon her, whispered in my ear, that if her baby was born alive and thrived, the day might come when it would not feel so much disgraced to hear its poor young mother named. And, oh, kind heaven, she said, folding her thin hands together, whether it be boy or girl, raise up some friends for it in this troubled world, and take pity upon a lonely, desolate child, abandoned to its mercy. "'The boy's name?' demanded the matron. "'They called him Oliver,' replied the woman feebly. "'The gold I stole was—' "'Yes, yes, what?' cried the other. She was bending eagerly over the woman to hear her reply, but drew back instinctively, as she once again rose slowly and stiffly into a sitting posture— then clutching the coverlet with both hands, muttered some indistinct sounds in her throat, and fell lifeless on the bed. "'Stone dead!' said one of the old women, hurrying in as soon as the door was opened. "'And nothing to tell after all,' rejoined the matron, walking carelessly away. The two crones, to all appearance, too busily occupied in the preparations for their dreadful duties to make any reply, were left alone hovering about the body. CHAPTER Twenty Five, Wherein this history reverts to Mr. Fagan and Company. While these things were passing in the country workhouse, Mr. Fagan sat in the old den, the same from which Oliver had been removed by the girl, brooding over a dull smoky fire. He held a pair of bellows upon his knee, with which he had apparently been endeavouring to rouse it into more cheerful action but he had fallen into deep thought, and with his arms folded on them, and his chin resting on his thumbs, fixed his eyes abstractedly on the rusty bars. At a table behind him sat the artful Dodger, Master Charles Bates, and Mr. Chitling, all intent upon a game of whist, the artful taking dummy against Master Bates and Mr. Chitling. The countenance of the first-named gentleman, peculiarly intelligent at all times, acquired great additional interest from his close observance of the game, and his attentive perusal of Mr. Chitling's hand, upon which, from time to time, as occasion served, he bestowed a variety of earnest glances, wisely regulating his own play by the result of his observations upon his neighbour's cards. It being a cold night, the Dodger wore his hat, as, indeed, was often his custom within doors. 
he also sustained a clay pipe between his teeth, which he only removed for a brief space when he deemed it necessary to apply for refreshment to a quart pot upon the table, which stood ready filled with gin and water for the accommodation of the company. Master Bates was also attentive to the play, but being of a more excitable nature than his accomplished friend, it was observable that he more frequently applied himself to the gin and water, and, moreover, indulged in many jests and irrelevant remarks, all highly unbecoming a scientific rubber. Indeed, the artful, presuming upon their close attachment, more than once took occasion to reason gravely with his companion upon these improprieties, all of which remonstrances Master Bates received in extremely good part, merely requesting his friend to be blowed, or to insert his head in a sack or replying with some other neatly turned witticism of a similar kind, the happy application of which excited considerable admiration in the mind of Mr. Chitling. It was remarkable that the latter gentleman and his partner invariably lost, and that the circumstance, so far from angering Master Bates, appeared to afford him the highest amusement, inasmuch as he laughed most uproariously at the end of every deal, and protested that he had never seen such a jolly game in all his born days. "'That's two doubles and the rub,' said Mr. Chitling, with a very long face, as he drew half a crown from his waistcoat pocket. "'I never see such a feller as you, Jack. You win everything. Even when we've good cards, Charlie and I can't make nothing of him.' Either the master or the manner of this remark, which was made very ruefully, delighted Charlie Bates so much that his consequent shout of laughter roused the Jew from his reverie, and induced him to inquire what was the matter. "'Matter, Fagin!' cried Charlie. "'I wish you had watched the play. "'Tommy Chitlin hasn't won a point, "'and I went partners with him against the artful and dumb.' "'Aye, aye,' said the Jew with a grin, "'which sufficiently demonstrated "'that he was at no loss to understand the reason. "'Try him again, Tom. Try him again.' "'No more of it for me, thank ye, Fagin,' replied Mr. Chitling. "'I've had enough.' That ere dodger is such a run of luck that there's no standing agin him. <laughs> My dear, replied the Jew, you must get up very early in the morning to win against the dodger. Morning, said Charlie Bates, you must put your boots on overnight, and have a telescope at each eye, and an opera glass between your shoulders if you want to come over him. Mr. Dawkins received these handsome compliments with much philosophy and offered to cut any gentleman in company for the first picture-card at a shilling at a time. Nobody accepting the challenge, and his pipe being by this time smoked out, he proceeded to amuse himself by sketching a ground plan of Newgate, on the table with a piece of chalk, which had served him in lieu of counters, whistling meantime with peculiar shrillness. "'How precious dull you are, Tommy,' said the Dodger, stopping short when there had been a long silence, and addressing Mr. Chitling. "'What do you think he's thinking of, Fagin?' "'How should I know, my dear?' replied the Jew, looking round as he plied the bellows. "'About his losses, maybe? Or the little retirement in the country that he's just left, eh? <laughs> Is that it, my dear?' "'Not a bit of it,' replied the Dodger, stopping the subject of discourse as Mr. Chitling was about to reply. "'What do you say, Charlie?' "'I should say,' replied Master Bates, with a grin, "'that he was uncommon sweet upon Betsy. "'See how he's a-blushing? <laughs> "'Oh, my eye! "'Here's a merry-go-rounder! "'Tom Chitlin's in love! "'Oh, Fagin, Fagin, what a spree!' Thoroughly overpowered with the notion of Mr. Chitling being the victim of the tender passion, Master Bates threw himself back in his chair with such violence that he lost his balance and pitched over upon the floor where, the accident abating nothing of his merriment, he lay at full length until his laugh was over, when he resumed his former position, and began another laugh. "'Never mind him, my dear,' said the Jew, winking at Mr. Dawkins, and giving Master Bates a reproving tap with the nozzle of the bellows. "'Betsy's a fine girl. Stick up to her, Tom. Stick up to her.' "'What I mean to say, Fagin,' replied Mr. Chitling, very red in the face, is that that isn't anything to anybody here. No more it is, replied the Jew. Charlie will talk. 
"'Don't mind him, my dear. Don't mind him. Betsy's a fine girl. Do as she bids you, Tom, and you will make your fortune.' "'So I do do as she bids me,' replied Mr. Chitling. "'I shouldn't have been milled if it hadn't been for her advice. But it turned out a good job for you, didn't it, Fagin? And what six weeks of it? It must come, some time or another, and why not in the winter time when you don't want to go out a walking so much, eh, Fagin? Ah, to be sure, my dear," replied the Jew. "You wouldn't mind it again, Tom, would you?" asked the Dodger, winking upon Charlie and the Jew. "If Bet was all right." "I mean to say that I shouldn't," replied Tom angrily. "There now, ah." "'Who'll say as much as that, I should like to know, eh, Fagin?' "'Nobody, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'Not a soul, Tom. "'I don't know one of them that would do it besides you. "'Not one of them, my dear. "'I might have got clear off if I'd spit upon her, mightn't I, Fagin?' "'Angrily pursued the poor half-witted dupe. "'A word for me would have done it, wouldn't it, Fagin?' "'To be sure it would, my dear.' replied the Jew. "'But I didn't blab it, did I, Fagin?' demanded Tom, pouring question upon question with great volubility. "'No, no, to be sure,' replied the Jew. "'You were too stout-hearted for that. A deal too stout, my dear.' "'Perhaps I was,' rejoined Tom, looking round. "'And if I was, what's to laugh at in that, eh, Fagin?' The Jew, perceiving that Mr. Chitling was considerably roused, hastened to assure him that nobody was laughing, and to prove the gravity of the company appealed to Master Bates, the principal offender. But, unfortunately, Charlie, in opening his mouth to reply that he was never more serious in his life, was unable to prevent the escape of such a violent roar that the abused Mr. Chitling, without any preliminary ceremonies, rushed across the room and aimed a blow at the offender who, being skilled in evading pursuit, ducked to avoid it, and chose his time so well that it lighted on the chest of the merry old gentleman, and caused him to stagger to the wall, where he stood panting for breath, while Mr. Chitling looked on in intense dismay. "'Hark!' cried the Dodger at this moment. "'I hear the tinkler!' Catching up the light, he crept softly upstairs. The bell was rung again, with some impatience, while the party were in darkness. After a short pause, the Dodger reappeared, and whispered Fagin mysteriously. "'What?' cried the Jew. "'Alone?' The Dodger nodded in the affirmative, and, shading the flame of the candle with his hand, gave Charlie Bates a private intimation, in dumb show, that he had better not be funny just then. Having performed this friendly office, he fixed his eyes on the Jew's face, and awaited his directions. The old man bit his yellow fingers, and meditated for some seconds, his face working with agitation the while, as if he dreaded something, and feared to know the worst. At length he raised his head. "'Where is he?' he asked. The Dodger pointed to the floor above, and made a gesture as if to leave the room. "'Yes,' said the Jew, answering the mute inquiry. "'Bring him down.' "'Quiet, Charlie. Gently, Tom. Scarce, scarce.' This brief direction to Charlie Bates, and his recent antagonist, was softly and immediately obeyed. There was no sound of their whereabout when the Dodger descended the stairs, bearing the light in his hand, and followed by a man in a coarse smock-frock, who, after casting a hurried glance round the room, pulled off a large wrapper which had concealed the lower portion of his face, and disclosed, all haggard, unwashed, and unshorn, the features of Flash Toby Crackett. "'How are you, Faggy?' said this worthy, nodding to the Jew. "'Pop that shawl away in my caster, Dodger, so that I may know where to find it when I cut. That's the time of day. You'll be a fine young cracksman afore the old file now.' With these words he pulled up the smock-frock, and, winding it round his middle, drew a chair to the fire, and placed his feet upon the hob. "'See there, Faggy," he said, pointing disconsolately to his top-boots. "'Not a drop of day in Martin since you know when. Not a bubble of blacking, by Jove! But don't look at me in that way, man. 
all in good time. I can't talk about business till I've eat and drank, so produce the sustenance, and let's have a quiet fill out for the first time these three days." The Jew motioned to the Dodger to place what eatables there were upon the table, and seating himself opposite the housebreaker, waited his leisure. To judge from appearances, Toby was by no means in a hurry to open the conversation. At first, the Jew contented himself with patiently watching his countenance, as if to gain from its expression some clue to the intelligence he brought, but in vain. He looked tired and worn, but there was the same complacent repose upon his features that they always wore, and through dirt and beard and whisker there still shone unimpaired the self-satisfied smirk of flash Toby Crackett. Then the Jew, in an agony of impatience, watched every morsel he put into his mouth, pacing up and down the room, meanwhile in irrepressible excitement. It was all of no use. Toby continued to eat with the utmost outward indifference, until he could eat no more. Then, ordering the Dodger out, he closed the door, mixed a glass of spirits and water, and composed himself for talking. First and foremost, Faggy," said Toby. "'Yes, yes,' interposed the Jew, drawing up his chair. Mr. Crackett stopped to take a draught of spirits and water, and to declare that the gin was excellent. Then, placing his feet against the low mantelpiece, so as to bring his boots to about the level of his eye, he quietly resumed. First and foremost, Faggy," said the housebreaker, "'how's Bill?' "'What?' screamed the Jew, starting from his seat. "'Why, you don't mean to say,' began Toby, turning pale. "'Mean!' cried the Jew, stamping furiously on the ground. "'Where are they? Sykes and the boy! Where are they? Where have they been? Where are they hiding? Why have they not been here?' "'The crack failed,' said Toby faintly. "'I know it.' replied the Jew, tearing a newspaper from his pocket and pointing to it. "'What more?' "'They fired and hit the boy. We cut over the fields at the back, with him between us, straight as the crow flies, through edge and ditch. They gave chase. Damn! The whole country was awake, and the dogs upon us.' "'The boy!' "'Bill had him on his back, and scudded like the wind. We stopped to take him between us. His head hung down, and he was cold.' They were close upon our heels, every man for himself, and each from the gallows. We parted company, and left the youngster lying in a ditch. Alive or dead, that's all I know about him." The Jew stopped to hear no more, but uttering a loud yell, and twining his hands in his hair, rushed from the room, and from the house. CHAPTER Twenty Six, In which a mysterious character appears upon the scene, and many things, inseparable from this history, are done and performed. The old man had gained the street corner before he began to recover the effect of Toby Crackett's intelligence. He had relaxed nothing of his unusual speed, but was still pressing onward in the same wild and disordered manner, when the sudden dashing past of a carriage, and a boisterous cry from the foot-passengers who saw his danger, drove him back upon the pavement avoiding as much as was possible all the main streets, and skulking only through the byways and alleys, he at length emerged on Snow Hill. Here he walked even faster than before. Nor did he linger until he had again turned into a court, when, as if conscious that he was now in his proper element, he fell into his usual shuffling pace, and seemed to breathe more freely. Near to the spot on which Snow Hill and Hoban Hill meet, opens, upon the right hand as you come out of the city, a narrow and dismal alley, leading to Saffron Hill. In its filthy shops are exposed for sale huge bunches of second-hand silk handkerchiefs, of all sizes and patterns, for here reside the traders who purchase them from the pickpockets. Hundreds of these handkerchiefs hang, dangling from pegs outside the windows, or flaunting from the door-posts, and the shelves within are piled with them. Confined as the limits of Field Lane are, it has its barber, its coffee-shop, its beer-shop, and its fried-fish warehouse. It is a commercial colony of itself, the emporium of petty larceny. Visited at early morning, and setting in of dusk, 
by silent merchants who traffic in dark back parlours, and who go as strangely as they come. Here the clothesman, the shoe vamper, and the rag merchant display their goods as signboards to the petty thief. Here stores of old iron and bones and heaps of mildewy fragments of woollen stuff and linen rust and rot in the grimy cellars. It was into this place that the Jew turned. He was well known to the sallow denizens of the lane, for such of them as were on the lookout to buy or sell nodded familiarly as he passed along. He replied to their salutations in the same way, but bestowed no closer recognition until he reached the further end of the alley, when he stopped to address a salesman of small stature, who had squeezed as much of his person into a child's chair as the chair would hold, and was smoking a pipe at his warehouse door. "'Why, the sight of you, Mr. Fagin, would cure the hop me said this respectable trader, in acknowledgment of the Jew's inquiry after his health. "'The neighbourhood was a little too hot, Lively,' said Fagin, elevating his eyebrows and crossing his hands upon his shoulders. "'Well, I heard that complaints of it once or twice before,' replied the trader. "'But it soon cools down again. Don't you find it so?' Fagin nodded in the affirmative. Pointing in the direction of Saffron Hill, he inquired whether any one was up yonder to-night. "'At the cripples?' inquired the man. The Jew nodded. "'Let me see,' pursued the merchant, reflecting. "'Yes, there's some half a dozen of them gone in. That I knows. I don't think your friend's there.' "'Sykes is not, I suppose?' inquired the Jew, with a disappointed countenance. "'Non is wentish, as the lawyers say,' replied the little man, shaking his head and looking amazingly sly. "'Have you got anything in my line to-night?' "'Nothing to-night,' said the Jew, turning away. "'Are you going out to the cripples, Fagin?' cried the little man, calling after him. "Stop." "'I don't mind if I have a drop there with you.' But as the Jew, looking back, waved his hand to intimate that he preferred being alone, and, moreover, as the little man could not very easily disengage himself from the chair, the sign of the cripples was, for a time, bereft of the advantage of Mr. Lively's presence. By the time he had got upon his legs, the Jew had disappeared. So Mr. Lively, after ineffectually standing on tiptoe, in the hope of catching sight of him, again forced himself into the little chair, and, exchanging a shake of the head with a lady in the opposite shop, in which doubt and mistrust were plainly mingled, resumed his pipe with a grave demeanour. The three cripples, or rather the cripples, which was the sign by which the establishment was familiarly known to its patrons, was the public-house in which Mr. Sykes and his dog have already figured. Merely making a sign to a man at the bar, Fagin walked straight upstairs, and opening the door of a room, and softly insinuating himself into the chamber, looked anxiously about, shading his eyes with his hand, as if in search of some particular person. The room was illuminated by two gaslights, the glare of which was prevented by the barred shutters and closely drawn curtains of faded red from being visible outside. The ceiling was blackened, to prevent its colour from being injured by the flaring of the lamps, and the place was so full of dense tobacco smoke that at first it was scarcely possible to discern anything more. By degrees, however, as some of it cleared away through the open door, an assemblage of heads, as confused as the noises that greeted the ear, might be made out, and as the eye grew more accustomed to the scene, the spectator gradually became aware of the presence of a numerous company, male and female, crowded round a long table, at the upper end of which sat a chairman with a hammer of office in his hand while a professional gentleman with a bluish nose, and his face tied up for the benefit of a toothache, presided at a jingling piano in a remote corner. As Fagin stepped softly in, the professional gentleman, running over the keys by way of prelude, occasioned a general cry of order for a song, which having subsided, a young lady proceeded to entertain the company with a ballad and four verses, between each of which the accompanist played the melody all through, as loud as he could. 
When this was over, the chairman made a sentiment, after which the professional gentleman on the chairman's right and left volunteered a duet, and sang it with great applause. It was curious to observe some faces which stood out prominently from among the group. There was the chairman himself, the landlord of the house, a coarse, rough, heavy-built fellow, who, while the songs were proceeding, rolled his eyes hither and thither, and, seeming to give himself up to joviality, had an eye for everything that was done, and an ear for everything that was said, and sharp ones, too. Near him were the singers, receiving with professional indifference the compliments of the company, and applying themselves in turn to a dozen proffered glasses of spirits and water, tendered by their more boisterous admirers, whose countenances, expressive of almost every vice in almost every grade, irresistibly attracted the attention by their very repulsiveness. Cunning, ferocity, and drunkenness in all its stages were there, in their strongest aspect. And women, some with the last lingering tinge of their early freshness almost fading as you looked, others with every mark and stamp of their sex utterly beaten out, and presenting but one loathsome blank of profligacy and crime. Some mere girls, others but young women, and none past the prime of life, formed the darkest and saddest portion of this dreary picture. Fagin, troubled by no grave emotions, looked eagerly from face to face while these proceedings were in progress, but apparently without meeting that of which he was in search. Succeeding at length in catching the eye of the man who occupied the chair, he beckoned to him slightly, and left the room as quietly as he had entered it. "'What can I do for you, Mr. Fagin?' inquired the man, as he followed him out to the landing. "'Won't you join us? They'll be delighted, every one of them.' The Jew shook his head impatiently, and said in a whisper, "'Is he here?' "'No,' replied the man. "'And no news of Barney?' inquired Fagin. "'None,' replied the landlord of the cripples, for it was he. "'He won't stir till it's all safe. Depend on it, they're on the scent down there, and that if he moved he'd blow upon the thing at once. He's all right enough, Barney is, else I should have heard of him. I'll pound it. That Barney's managing properly. Let him alone for that.' "'Will he be here to-night?' asked the Jew laying the same emphasis on the pronoun as before. "'Monks, do you mean?' inquired the landlord, hesitating. "'Hush!' said the Jew. "'Yes.' "'Certain,' replied the man, drawing a gold watch from his fob. "'I expect him here before now. If you wait ten minutes, he'll be—' "'No, no,' said the Jew hastily, as though, however desirous he might be to see the person in question— he was nevertheless relieved by his absence. "'Tell him I came here to see him, and that he must come to me to-night. No, say, to-morrow. As he is not here, to-morrow will be time enough.' "'Good,' said the man. "'Nothing more?' "'Not a word now,' said the Jew, descending the stairs. "'I say,' said the other, looking over the rails and speaking in a hoarse whisper, what a time this would be for a cell! I've got Phil Barker here, so drunk that a boy might take him." "'Ah, but it's not Phil Barker's time,' said the Jew, looking up. "'Phil has something more to do before we can afford to part with him. So go back to the company, my dear, and tell them to lead merry lives. While they last. <laughs> the landlord reciprocated the old man's laugh, and returned to his guests. The Jew was no sooner alone than his countenance resumed its former expression of anxiety and thought. After a brief reflection, he called a hack cabriolet, and bade the man drive towards Bethnal Green. He dismissed him within some quarter of a mile of Mr. Sykes's residence and performed the short remainder of the distance on foot. "'Now,' muttered the Jew as he knocked at the door, "'if there is any deep play here, I shall have it out of you, my girl, cunning as you are.' She was in her room, the woman said. 
Fagin crept softly upstairs and entered it without any previous ceremony. The girl was alone, lying with her head upon the table and her hair straggling over it. "'She has been drinking,' thought the Jew coolly, "'or perhaps she is only miserable.' The old man turned to close the door, as he made this reflection. The noise thus occasioned roused the girl. She eyed his crafty face narrowly, as she inquired to his recital of Toby Crackett's story. When it was concluded, she sank into her former attitude, but spoke not a word. She pushed the candle impatiently away, and once or twice, as she feverishly changed her position, shuffled her feet upon the ground, but this was all. During the silence, the Jew looked restlessly about the room, as if to assure himself that there were no appearances of Sykes having covertly returned. Apparently satisfied with his inspection, he coughed twice or thrice, and made as many efforts to open a conversation. But the girl heeded him no more than if he had been made of stone. At length he made another attempt, and rubbing his hands together, said in his most conciliatory tone, "'And where should you think Bill was now, my dear?' The girl moaned out some half-intelligible reply, that she could not tell, and seemed, from the smothered noise that escaped her, to be crying. "'And the boy, too?' said the Jew, straining his eyes to catch a glimpse of her face. "'Poor little child! Left in a ditch, Nance! Only think!' "'A child!' said the girl, suddenly looking up. "'It's better where he is than among us. And if no harm comes to build from it, I hope he lies dead in the ditch, and that his young bones may rot there.' "'What?' cried the Jew, in amazement. "'Aye, I do,' returned the girl, meeting his gaze. "'I shall be glad to have him away from my eyes, and to know that the worst is over. I can't bear to have him about me. The sight of him turns me against myself, and all of you.' <laughs> said the Jew scornfully. "'You're drunk!' "'Am I?' cried the girl bitterly. "'It's no fault of yours if I am not. You'd never have me anything else, if you had your will. Except now, the humour doesn't suit you, does it?' "'No,' rejoined the Jew furiously. "'It does not.' "'Change it, then,' responded the girl with a laugh. "'Change it?' exclaimed the Jew exasperated beyond all bounds by his companion's unexpected obstinacy, and the vexation of the night. "'I will change it. Listen to me, you drab. Listen to me, who with six words can strangle Sykes as surely as if I had his bull's throat between my fingers now. If he comes back, and leaves the boy behind him, if he gets off free, and dead or alive, fails to restore him to me, murder him yourself if you would have him escape, Jack Ketch, and do it the moment he sets foot in this room, or mind me, it will be too late." "'What is all this?' cried the girl involuntarily. "'What is it?' pursued Fagin, mad with rage, when the boy's worth hundreds of pounds to me, am I to lose what chance threw me in the way of getting safely through the whims of a drunken gang that I could whistle away the lives of, and me bound, too, to a born devil that only wants the will and has the power to—to—' to... <sighs> Panting for breath, the old man stammered for a word, and in that instant checked the torrent of his wrath and changed his whole demeanour. A moment before, his clenched hands had grasped the air, his eyes had dilated, and his face grown livid with passion. But now he shrunk into a chair, and, cowering together, trembled with the apprehension of having himself disclosed some hidden villainy. After a short silence, he ventured to look around at his companion. He appeared somewhat reassured, on beholding her in the same listless attitude from which he had first roused her. "'Nancy, dear,' croaked the Jew in his usual voice, "'did you mind me, dear?' "'Don't worry me now, Fagin,' replied the girl, raising her head languidly. "'If Bill has not done it this time, he will another. He has done many a good job for you, and will do many more when he can, and when he can't, he won't. 
So no more about that. Regarding this boy, my dear, said the Jew, rubbing the palms of his hands nervously together. The boy must take his chance with the rest, interrupted Nancy hastily. And I say again, I hope he is dead, and out of harm's way, and out of yours. That is, if Bill comes to no harm. And if Toby got clear off, Bill's pretty sure to be safe, for Bill's worth two of Toby any time. And about what I was saying, my dear, observed the Jew, keeping his glistening eye steadily upon her. You must say it all over again, if it's anything you want me to do, rejoined Nancy. And if it is, you had better wait till to-morrow. You put me up for a minute, but now I'm stupid again. Fagin put several other questions, all with the same drift of ascertaining whether the girl had profited by his unguarded hints. But she answered them so readily, and was withal so utterly unmoved by his searching looks, that his original impression of her being more than a trifle in liquor was confirmed. Nancy, indeed, was not exempt from a failing which is very common among the Jews' female pupils, and in which, in their tenderer years, they were rather encouraged than checked. Her disordered appearance, and a wholesale perfume of Geneva which pervaded the apartment, afforded strong confirmatory evidence of the justice of the Jews' supposition. And when, after indulging in the temporary display of violence above described, she subsided, first into dullness, and afterwards into a compound of feelings, under the influence of which she shed tears one minute, and in the next gave utterance to various exclamations of, Never say die, and diverse calculations as to what might be the amount of the odds, so long as a lady or gentleman was happy. Mr. Fagin, who had had considerable experience of such matters in his time, saw with great satisfaction that she was very far gone indeed. Having eased his mind by this discovery, and having accomplished his twofold object of imparting to the girl what he had, that night, heard, and of ascertaining with his own eyes that Sykes had not returned, Mr. Fagin again turned his face homeward, leaving his young friend asleep with her head upon the table. It was within an hour of midnight. The weather being dark and piercing cold, he had no great temptation to loiter. The sharp wind that scoured the streets seemed to have cleared them of passengers, as of dust and mud, for few people were abroad, and they were to all appearance hastening fast home. It blew from the right quarter for the Jew, however, and straight before it he went, trembling and shivering as every fresh gust drove him rudely on his way. He had reached the corner of his own street, and was already fumbling in his pocket for the door-key, when a dark figure emerged from a projecting entrance which lay in deep shadow, and, crossing the road, glided up to him unperceived. "'Fagin!' whispered a voice close to his ear. "'Ah!' said the Jew, turning quickly round. "'Is that—' "'Yes,' interrupted the stranger. "'I have been lingering here these two hours. Where the devil have you been?' "'On your business, my dear,' replied the Jew, glancing uneasily at his companion, and slackening his pace as he spoke. "'On your business all night?' "'Oh, of course,' said the stranger with a sneer. "'Well, and what's come of it?' "'Nothing good,' said the Jew. "'Nothing bad, I hope,' said the stranger, stopping short, and turning a startled look on his companion. The Jew shook his head, and was about to reply, when the stranger, interrupting him, motioned to the house before which they had by this time arrived, remarking that he had better say what he had got to say under cover, for his blood was chilled with standing about so long, and the wind blew through him. Fagin looked as if he could have willingly excused himself from taking home a visitor at that unseasonable hour, and, indeed, muttered something about having no fire. But his companion, repeating his request in a peremptory manner, he unlocked the door, and requested him to close it softly, while he got a light. "'It's as dark as the grave,' said the man, groping forward a few steps. "'Make haste!' "'Shut the door!' whispered Fagin from the end of the passage. As he spoke, it closed with a loud noise. "'That wasn't my doing,' said the other man, feeling his way. "'The wind blew it, too, or it shut of its own accord. One or the other. Look sharp with the light, or I shall knock my brains out against something in this confounded hole.' 
Fagin stealthily descended the kitchen stairs. After a short absence, he returned with a lighted candle, and the intelligence that Toby Crackett was asleep in the back room below, and that the boys were in the front one. Beckoning the man to follow him, he led the way upstairs. "'We can say the few words we've got to say in here, my dear,' said the Jew, throwing open a door on the first floor. "'And as there are holes in the shutters, and we never show lights to our neighbours, we'll set the candle on the stairs. There!' With those words, the Jew, stooping down, placed the candle on an upper flight of stairs, exactly opposite to the room door. This done, he led the way into the apartment, which was destitute of all movables save a broken armchair, and an old couch or sofa without covering, which stood behind the door. Upon this piece of furniture the stranger sat himself with the air of a weary man, and the Jew, drawing up the armchair opposite, they sat face to face. It was not quite dark. The door was partially open, and the candle outside threw a feeble reflection on the opposite wall. They conversed for some time in whispers, though nothing of the conversation was distinguishable beyond a few disjointed words here and there. A listener might easily have perceived that Fagin appeared to be defending himself against some remarks of the stranger, and that the latter was in a state of considerable irritation. They might have been talking, thus, for a quarter of an hour or more, when monks, by which name the Jew had designated the strange man several times in the course of their colloquy, said, raising his voice a little, "'I tell you again, it was badly planned. Why not have kept him here among the rest, and made a sneaking, snivelling pickpocket of him at once?' "'Only hear him!' exclaimed the Jew, shrugging his shoulders. "'Why, do you mean to say you couldn't have done it if you had chosen?' demanded Monk sternly. "'Haven't you done it with other boys scores of times? If you had had patience for a twelve-month, at most, couldn't you have got him convicted, and sent safely out of the kingdom, perhaps for life?' "'Whose turn would that have served, my dear?' inquired the Jew humbly. "'Mine,' replied Monks. "'But not mine,' said the Jew submissively. "'He might have become of use to me.' When there are two parties to a bargain, it is only reasonable that the interests of both should be consulted. Is it, my good friend?" "'What, then?' demanded Monks. "'I saw it was not easy to train him to the business,' replied the Jew. "'He was not like other boys in the same circumstances.' "'Curse him, no,' muttered the man, or he would have been a thief long ago. "'I had no hold upon him to make him worse,' pursued the Jew, anxiously watching the countenance of his companion. "'His hand was not in. I had nothing to frighten him with, which we always must have in the beginning, or we labour in vain. What could I do? Send him out with the Dodger and Charlie? We had enough of that at first, my dear. I trembled for us all.' "'That was not my doing,' observed Monks. "'No, no, my dear,' renewed the Jew, "'and I don't quarrel with it now, because, if it had never happened, you might never have clapped eyes on the boy to notice him, and so led to the discovery that it was him you were looking for. Well, I got him back for you by means of the girl, and then— she begins to favour him. Throttle the girl, said Monks impatiently. Why, we can't afford to do that just now, my dear, replied the Jew, smiling. And, besides, that sort of thing is not in our way, or one of these days I might be glad to have it done. I know what these girls are, Monks, well. As soon as the boy begins to harden, she'll care no more for him than for a block of wood. You want him made a thief? If he is alive, I can make him one from this time, and if—if—' said the Jew, drawing nearer to the other, "'it's not likely, mind. But if the worst comes to the worst, and he is dead—' "'It's no fault of mine if he is,' 
interposed the other man with a look of terror, and clasping the Jew's arm with trembling hands. "'Mind that, Fagin. I had no hand in it. Anything but his death I told you from the first. I won't shed blood. It's always found out, and haunts a man besides. If they shot him dead, I was not the cause. Do you hear me? Fire this infernal den. What's that?' "'What?' cried the Jew, grasping the coward round the body with both arms as he sprang to his feet. "'Where?' "'Yonder,' replied the man, glaring at the opposite wall. "'A shadow. I saw the shadow of a woman, in a cloak and bonnet, pass along the wainscot like a breath.' The Jew released his hold, and they rushed tumultuously from the room. The candle, wasted by the draught, was standing where it had been placed. It showed them only the empty staircase, and their own white faces. They listened intently. A profound silence reigned throughout the house. "'It's your fancy,' said the Jew, taking up the light, and turning to his companion. "'I swear I saw it,' replied Monks, trembling. "'It was bending forward when I saw it first, and when I spoke, it darted away.' The Jew glanced contemptuously at the pale face of his associate, and, telling him he could follow if he pleased, ascended the stairs. They looked into all the rooms. They were cold, bare, and empty. They descended into the passage, and thence into the cellars below. The green damp hung upon the low walls. The tracks of the snail and slug glistened in the light of the candle, but all was still as death. "'What do you think now?' said the Jew, when they had regained the passage. "'Besides ourselves, there's not a creature in the house, except Toby and the boys, and they're safe enough. See here.' As a proof of the fact, the Jew drew forth two keys from his pocket, and explained that when he first went downstairs, he had locked them in, to prevent any intrusion on the conference. This accumulated testimony effectually staggered Mr. Monks. His protestations had gradually become less and less vehement, as they proceeded in their search without making any discovery, and now he gave vent to several very grim laughs and confessed it could only have been his excited imagination. He declined any renewal of the conversation, however, for that night, suddenly remembering that it was past one o'clock, and so the amiable couple parted. CHAPTER Twenty Seven. Atones for the unpoliteness of a former chapter, which deserted a lady most unceremoniously. As it would be, by no means seemly in a humble author, to keep so mighty a personage as a beadle waiting, with his back to the fire, and the skirts of his coat gathered up under his arms, until such time as it might suit his pleasure to relieve him, and, as it would still less become his station, or his gallantry, to involve in the same neglect a lady on whom that beadle had looked with an eye of tenderness and affection and in whose ear he had whispered sweet words, which, coming from such a quarter, might well thrill the bosom of maid or matron of whatsoever degree. The historian whose pen traces these words, trusting that he knows his place, and that he entertains a becoming reverence for those upon earth to whom high and important authority is delegated, hastens to pay them that respect which their position demands and to treat them with all that duteous ceremony which their exalted rank, and, by consequence, great virtues, imperatively claim at his hands. Towards this end, indeed, he had purposed to introduce, in this place, a dissertation touching the divine right of beadles, and elucidative of the position that a beadle can do no wrong, which could not fail to have been both pleasurable and profitable to the right-minded reader but which he is unfortunately compelled, by want of time and space, to postpone to some more convenient and fitting opportunity, on the arrival of which he will be prepared to show that a beadle properly constituted, that is to say, a parochial beadle, attached to a parochial workhouse, and attending in his official capacity the parochial church, is, in right and virtue of his office, possessed of all the excellences and best qualities of humanity. And— that to none of those excellences can mere company's beadles, or court of law beadles, or even chapel of ease beadles, save the last, and they in a very lowly and inferior degree, lay the remotest sustainable claim. Mr. Bumble had recounted the teaspoons, 
re-weighed the sugar-tongs, made a closer inspection of the milk-pot, and ascertained to a nicety the exact condition of the furniture, down to the very horsehair seats of the chairs, and had repeated each process full half a dozen times, before he began to think that it was time for Mrs. Corney to return. Thinking begets thinking. As there were no sounds of Mrs. Corney's approach, it occurred to Mr. Bumble that it would be an innocent and virtuous way of spending the time, if he were further to allay his curiosity by a cursory glance at the interior of Mrs. Corney's chest of drawers. Having listened at the keyhole, to assure himself that nobody was approaching the chamber, Mr. Bumble, beginning at the bottom, proceeded to make himself acquainted with the contents of the three long drawers which, being filled with various garments of good fashion and texture, carefully preserved between two layers of old newspapers, speckled with dried lavender, seemed to yield him exceeding satisfaction. Arriving in course of time at the right-hand corner drawer, in which was the key, and beholding therein a small padlocked box, which, being shaken, gave forth a pleasant sound, as if of the chinking of coin, Mr. Bumble returned with a stately walk to the fireplace and, resuming his old attitude, said, with a grave and determined air, "'I'll do it.' He followed up this remarkable declaration by shaking his head in a waggish manner for ten minutes, as though he were remonstrating with himself for being such a pleasant dog. And then he took a view of his legs in profile with much seeming pleasure and interest. He was still placidly engaged in this latter survey, when Mrs. Corney, hurrying into the room, threw herself in a breathless state on a chair by the fireside, and covering her eyes with one hand, placed the other over her heart, and gasped for breath. "'Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble, stooping over the matron, "'what is this, ma'am? Has anything happened, ma'am? Pray answer me. I'm on—on—' Mr. Bumble, in his alarm, could not immediately think of the word tenterhooks, so he said, broken bottles. Oh. "'Mr. Bumble!' cried the lady. "'I've been so dreadfully put out!' "'Put out, ma'am?' exclaimed Mr. Bumble. "'Who has dared to—' "'I know,' said Mr. Bumble, checking himself with native majesty. "'This is them wishes paupers.' "'It's dreadful to think of,' said the lady, shuddering. "'Then don't think of it, ma'am.' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'I can't help it,' whimpered the lady. "'Then take something, Mob," said Mr. Bumble, soothingly. "'A little of the wine?' "'Not for the world,' replied Mrs. Corney. "'I couldn't. Oh! The top shelf in the right-hand corner. Oh!' Uttering these words, the good lady pointed distractedly to the cupboard, and underwent a convulsion from internal spasms. Mr. Bumble rushed to the closet, and, snatching a pint green glass bottle from the shelf, thus incoherently indicated, filled a teacup with its contents, and held it to the lady's lips. Oh, "'I'm better now,' said Mrs. Corney, falling back after drinking half of it. Mr. Bumble raised his eyes piously to the ceiling in thankfulness, and bringing them down again to the brim of the cup, lifted it to his nose. "'Peppermint!' exclaimed Mrs. Corney, in a faint voice, smiling gently on the beadle as she spoke. Uh, "'Try it. Uh, there's a little—a uh, little—something uh, else in it.' Mr. Bumble tasted the medicine with a doubtful look, smacked his lips, took another taste, and put the cup down empty. "'It's very comforting,' said Mrs. Corney. "'Very much so indeed, ma'am,' said the beadle. As he spoke, he drew a chair beside the matron and tenderly inquired what had happened to distress her. "'Nothing,' replied Mrs. Corney. "'I'm a foolish, excitable, weak creature.' "'Not weak, ma'am,' retorted Mr. Bumble, drawing his chair a little closer. "'Are you a weak creature, Mrs. Corney?' "'We're all weak creatures,' said Mrs. Corney, laying down a general principle. "'So we are,' said the beadle. Nothing was said on either side for a minute or two afterwards. By the expiration of that time, Mr. Bumble had illustrated the position by removing his left arm from the back of Mrs. Corney's chair, where it had previously rested, to Mrs. Corney's apron-string, round which it gradually became entwined. "'We are all weak creatures,' said Mr. Bumble. Mrs. Corney sighed. 
"'Don't sigh, Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble. "'I can't help it,' said Mrs. Corney, and she sighed again. "'This is a very comfortable room, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, looking round. "'Another room, and this, ma'am, would be a complete thing.' "'It would be too much for one,' murmured the lady. "'But not for two, ma'am,' rejoined Mr. Bumble, in soft accents. "'Eh, Mrs. Corney?' Mrs. Corney drooped her head, when the beadle said this. The beadle drooped his, to get a view of Mrs. Corney's face. Mrs. Corney, with great propriety, turned her head away, and released her hand to get at her pocket-handkerchief, but insensibly replaced it in that of Mr. Bumble. "'The board allows you coals, don't they, Mrs. Corney?' inquired the beadle, affectionately pressing her hand. "'And candles,' replied Mrs. Corney, slightly returning the pressure. "'Coals, candles, and house rent free,' said Mr. Bumble. "'Oh, Mrs. Corney, what an angel you are!' The lady was not proof against this burst of feelings. She sank into Mr. Bumble's arms, and that gentleman, in his agitation, imprinted a passionate kiss upon her chaste nose. "'Such parochial perfection!' exclaimed Mr. Bumble rapturously. "'You know that Mr. Slout is worse to-night, my fascinator?' "'Yes,' replied Mrs. Corney, bashfully. "'He can't live a week, the doctor says,' pursued Mr. Bumble. "'He is the master of this establishment. His death will cause a vacancy. That vacancy must be filled up. Oh, Mrs. Corney, what a prospect this opens! "'What an opportunity for a jining of arts and housekeepings,' said Mr. Bumble, bending over the bashful beauty. "'The one little, little, little word, my blessed Corney.' "'Yes, yeah, yeah, yes,' sighed out the matron. "'One more,' pursued the beadle. "'Compose your darling feelings for only one more. When is it to come off?' Mrs. Corney twice essayed to speak, and twice failed. At length, summoning up courage, she threw her arms around Mr. Bumble's neck, and said it might be as soon as ever he pleased, and that he was a irresistible duck. Matters being thus amicably and satisfactorily arranged, the contract was solemnly ratified in another teacupful of the peppermint mixture, which was rendered the more necessary by the flutter and agitation of the lady's spirits. While it was being disposed of, she acquainted Mr. Bumble with the old woman's decease. "'Very good,' said that gentleman, sipping his peppermint. "'I'll call at Sowerberry's as I go home, and tell him to send to-morrow morning. Was it that as frightened you, love?' "'It wasn't anything particular, dear,' said the lady evasively. "'He must have been something, love,' urged Mr. Bumble. "'Won't you tell your own bee?' "'Not now,' rejoined the lady. "'One of these days, after we're married, dear.' "'After we're married,' exclaimed Mr. Bumble. "'It wasn't any impudence from any of them male paupers as—' "'No, no, love,' interposed the lady hastily. "'If I thought it was,' continued Mr. Bumble, "'if I thought as any one of them had dared to lift his vulgar eyes to that lovely countenance, "'They wouldn't have dared to do it, love,' responded the lady. "'They had better not,' said Mr. Bumble, clenching his fist. "'Let me see any man, parochial or extra-parochial, as would presume to do it, and I can tell him that he wouldn't do it a second time.' Unembellished by any violence of gesticulation, this might have seemed no very high compliment to the lady's charms, but, as Mr. Bumble accompanied the threat with many warlike gestures, she was much touched with this proof of his devotion, and protested with great admiration that he was indeed a dove. The dove then turned up his coat-collar, and put on his cocked hat, and having exchanged a long and affectionate embrace with his future partner, once again braved the cold wind of the night, merely pausing for a few minutes in the male pauper's ward to abuse them a little, with the view of satisfying himself that he could fill the office of workhouse-master with needful acerbity. 
Assured of his qualifications, Mr. Bumble left the building with a light heart, and bright visions of his future promotion, which served to occupy his mind until he reached the shop of the undertaker. Now Mr. and Mrs. Sowerberry, having gone out to tea and supper, and Noah Claypole, not being at any time disposed to take upon himself a greater amount of physical exertion than is necessary to a convenient performance of the two functions of eating and drinking, the shop was not closed, although it was past the usual hour of shutting up. Mr. Bumble tapped with his cane on the counter several times, but attracting no attention, and beholding a light shining through the glass window of the little parlour at the back of the shop, he made bold to peep in and see what was going forward, and when he saw what was going forward, he was not a little surprised. The cloth was laid for supper. The table was covered with bread and butter, plates and glasses, a porter-pot, and a wine-bottle. At the upper end of the table, Mr. Noah Claypole lolled negligently in an easy chair, with his legs thrown over one of the arms, an open clasp-knife in one hand, and a mass of buttered bread in the other. Close beside him stood Charlotte, opening oysters from a barrel, which Mr. Claypole condescended to swallow with remarkable avidity. A more than ordinary redness in the region of the young gentleman's nose, and a kind of fixed wink in his right eye, denoted that he was in a slight degree intoxicated. These symptoms were confirmed by the intense relish with which he took his oysters, for which nothing but a strong appreciation of their cooling properties, in cases of internal fever, could have sufficiently accounted. "'He is a delicious fat one, Noah, dear,' said Charlie. "'Try him, do, only this one.' "'What a delicious thing is a oyster,' remarked Mr. Claypole, after he had swallowed it. "'What a pity it is! A number of them should ever make you feel uncomfortable, isn't it, Charlotte?' "'It's quite a cruelty,' said Charlotte. "'So it is,' acquiesced Mr. Claypole. "'Aren't you fond of oysters?' "'Not over much,' replied Charlotte. "'I like to see you eat em, Noah, dear. Better than eating em myself.' "'Law!' said Noah reflectively. "'How queer!' "'Have another,' said Charlotte. "'Here's one with such a beautiful, delicate beard.' "'I can't manage any more,' said Noah. "'I'm very sorry. Come here, Charlotte, and I'll kiss you.' "'What?' said Mr. Bumble, bursting into the room. "'Say that again, sir?' Charlotte uttered a scream, and hid her face in her apron. Mr. Claypole, without making any further change in his position than suffering his legs to reach the ground, gazed at the beadle in drunken terror. "'Say it again, you wild, audacious fellow!' said Mr. Bumble. "'How dare you mention such a thing, sir? And how dare you encourage him, you insolent minx?' "'Kiss her!' exclaimed Mr. Bumble, in strong indignation. "'Fuh! Oh, I didn't mean to do it,' said Noah, blubbering. "'She's always a-kissing of me, whether I like it or not.' "'Oh, Noah!' cried Charlotte, reproachfully. "'You are! You, you know you are!' retorted Noah. "'She's always a-doing of it, Mr. Bumble, sir. She chucks me under the chin, please, sir, and, and, and makes all, all manner of love.' "'Silence!' cried Mr. Bumble, sternly. "'Take yourself downstairs, ma'am. Noah, you shut up the shop. Say another word till your master comes home at your peril. And when he does come home, tell him that Mr. Bumble said he was to send an old woman's shell after breakfast tomorrow morning. Do you hear, sir? Kiss him, cried Mr. Bumble, holding up his hands. The sin and wickedness of the lower orders in this parochial district is frightful. If Parliament don't take their abominable courses under consideration, this country's ruined, and the character of the peasantry gone for ever. With these words the beadle strode with a lofty and gloomy air from the undertaker's premises. And now that we have accompanied him so far on his road home, and have made all necessary preparations for the old woman's funeral, let us set on foot a few inquiries after young Oliver Twist, and ascertain whether he be still lying in the ditch where Toby Crackett left him. Chapter Twenty Eight Looks After Oliver and proceeds with his adventures. "'Wolves tear your throats!' muttered Sykes, grinding his teeth. "'I wish I was among some of you. You'd howl the horse for it.' As Sykes growled forth this imprecation, with the most desperate ferocity that his desperate nature was capable of, 
he rested the body of the wounded boy across his bended knee, and turned his head for an instant to look back at his pursuers. There was little to be made out in the mist and darkness, but the loud shouting of men vibrated through the air, and the barking of the neighbouring dogs, roused by the sound of the alarm-bell, resounded in every direction. "'Stop, you white-livered hound!' cried the robber, shouting after Toby Crackett, who, making the best use of his long legs, was already ahead. "'Stop!' The repetition of the word brought Toby to a dead standstill, for he was not quite satisfied that he was beyond the range of pistol-shot, and Sykes was in no mood to be played with. "'Bear a hand with the boy!' cried Sykes, beckoning furiously to his confederate. "'Come back!' Toby made a show of returning, but ventured in a low voice, broken for want of breath, to intimate considerable reluctance as he came slowly along. "'Quicker!' cried Sykes, laying the boy in a dry ditch at his feet, and drawing a pistol from his pocket. "'Don't play booty with me!' At this moment the noise grew louder. Sykes, again looking round, could discern that the men who had given chase were already climbing the gate of the field in which he stood and that a couple of dogs were some paces in advance of them. "'He's all up, Bill!' cried Toby. "'Drop the kid, and show me your heels!' With this parting advice, Mr. Crackett, preferring the chance of being shot by his friend to the certainty of being taken by his enemies, fairly turned tail and darted off at full speed. Sykes clenched his teeth, took one look around, threw over the prostrate form of Oliver the cape in which he had been hurriedly muffled, ran along the front of the hedge, as if to distract the attention of those behind, from the spot where the boy lay, paused, for a second, before another hedge which met it at right angles, and whirling his pistol high into the air, cleared it at a bound, and was gone. "'Ho, ho, there!' cried a tremulous voice in the rear. "'Pincher! Neptune! Come here! Come here!' The dogs, who in common with their masters, seemed to have no particular relish for the sport in which they were engaged, readily answered to the command. Three men, who had by this time advanced some distance into the field, stopped to take counsel together. "'My advice, or at least raise, I should say, my orders, is,' said the fattest man of the party, "'that we immediately go home again.' "'I'm agreeable to anything which is agreeable to Mr. Giles,' said a shorter man who was by no means of a slim figure, and who was very pale in the face, and very polite, as frightened men frequently are. "'I shouldn't wish to appear ill-mannered, gentlemen,' said the third, who had called the dogs back. "'Mr. Giles ought to know.' "'Certainly,' replied the shorter man. "'And whatever Mr. Giles says, it isn't our place to contradict him. No, no, I, I know my situation. Thank my stars, I know my situation.' To tell the truth, the little man did seem to know his situation, and to know perfectly well that it was by no means a desirable one, for his teeth chattered in his head as he spoke. "'You are afraid, Brittles,' said Mr. Giles. "'I ain't,' said Brittles. "'You are,' said Giles. "'You're a falsehood, Mr. Giles,' said Brittles. "'You're a lie, Brittles,' said Mr. Giles. Now, these four retorts— arose from Mr. Giles's taunt, and Mr. Giles's taunt had arisen from his indignation at having the responsibility of going home again, imposed upon himself under cover of a compliment. The third man brought the dispute to its close most philosophically. "'I'll tell you what it is, gentlemen,' said he. "'We're all afraid.' "'Speak for yourself, sir,' said Mr. Giles, who was the palest of the party. "'So I do.' replied the man. "'It's natural and proper to be afraid under such circumstances. I am.' "'So am I,' said Brittles. "'Only there's no call to tell a man he is so bounceably.' These frank admissions softened Mr. Giles, who had once owned that he was afraid, upon which they all three faced about, and ran back again with the completest unanimity until Mr. Giles, who had the shortest wind of the party, as was encumbered with the pitchfork, most handsomely insisted on stopping, to make an apology for his hastiness of speech. "'But it is wonderful,' said Mr. Giles, when he had explained, "'what a man will do, when his blood is up. 
I should have committed murder, I know I should, if we'd caught one of them rascals. As the other two were impressed with a similar presentiment, and as their blood, like his, had all gone down again, some speculation ensued upon the cause of this sudden change in their temperament. "'I know what it was,' said Mr. Giles. "'It was the gate.' "'I and wonder if it was,' exclaimed Brittles, catching at the idea. "'You may depend upon it.' said Giles, that that gate stopped the flow of the excitement. I felt all mine suddenly going away as I was climbing over it. By a remarkable coincidence, the other two had been visited with the same unpleasant sensation at that precise moment. It was quite obvious, therefore, that it was the gate, especially as there was no doubt regarding the time at which the change had taken place, because all three remembered that they had come in sight of the robbers at the instant of its occurrence. This dialogue was held between the two men who had surprised the burglars, and a travelling tinker who had been sleeping in an outhouse, and who had been roused, together with his two mongrel curs, to join in the pursuit. Mr. Giles acted in the double capacity of butler and steward to the old lady of the mansion. Bittles was a lad of all work who, having entered her service a mere child, was treated as a promising young boy still, though he was something past thirty. Encouraging each other with such converse as this, but keeping very close together notwithstanding, and looking apprehensively round whenever a fresh gust rattled through the boughs, the three men hurried back to a tree behind which they had left their lantern, lest its light should inform the thieves in what direction to fire. Catching up the light, they made the best of their way home at a good round trot and long after their dusky forms had ceased to be discernible, the light might have been seen twinkling and dancing in the distance like some exhalation of the damp and gloomy atmosphere through which it was swiftly borne. The air grew colder as day came slowly on, and the mist rolled along the ground like a dense cloud of smoke. The grass was wet, the pathways and low places were all mire and water, the damp breath of an unwholesome wind went languidly by with a hollow moaning. Still, Oliver lay motionless and insensible on the spot where Sykes had left him. Morning drew on apace. The air became more sharp and piercing, as its first dull hue, the death of night, rather than the birth of day, glimmered faintly in the sky. The objects which had looked dim and terrible in the darkness grew more and more defined, and gradually resolved into their familiar shapes. The rain came down, thick and fast and pattered noisily among the leafless bushes. But Oliver felt it not, as it beat against him, for he still lay stretched, helpless and unconscious, on his bed of clay. At length a low cry of pain broke the stillness that prevailed, and uttering it the boy awoke. His left arm, rudely bandaged in a shawl, hung heavy and useless at his side. The bandage was saturated with blood. He was so weak that he could scarcely raise himself into a sitting posture. When he had done so, he looked feebly round for help, and groaned with pain. Trembling in every joint, from cold and exhaustion, he made an effort to stand upright, but, shuddering from head to foot, fell prostrate on the ground. After a short return of the stupor in which he had been so long plunged, Oliver, urged by a creeping sickness at his heart, which seemed to warn him that if he lay there he must surely die, got upon his feet and essayed to walk. His head was dizzy, and he staggered to and fro like a drunken man. But he kept up, nevertheless, and, with his head drooping languidly on his breast, went stumbling onward, he knew not whither. And now hosts of bewildering and confused ideas came crowding on his mind. He seemed to be still walking between Sykes and Crackett, who were angrily disputing, for the very words they said sounded in his ears. And when he caught his own attention, as it were, by making some violent effort to save himself from falling, he found that he was talking to them. Then he was alone with Sykes, plodding on as on the previous day. And as shadowy people passed them, he felt the robber's grasp upon his wrist. Suddenly he started back at the report of firearms. There rose into the air loud cries and shouts. Lights gleamed before his eyes. All was noise and tumult, as some unseen hand bore him hurriedly away. Through all these rapid visions there ran an undefined, uneasy consciousness of pain, which wearied and tormented him incessantly. 
Thus he staggered on, creeping almost mechanically between the bars of gates, or through the hedge-gaps as they came in his way, until he reached a road. Here the rain began to fall so heavily that it roused him. He looked about, and saw that at no great distance there was a house, which perhaps he could reach. Pitying his condition, they might have compassion on him, and if they did not, it would be better, he thought, to die near human beings than in the lonely open fields. He summoned up all his strength for one last trial, and bent his faltering steps towards it. As he drew nearer to this house, a feeling came over him that he had seen it before. He remembered nothing of its details, but the shape and aspect of the building seemed familiar to him. That garden wall! On the grass inside he had fallen on his knees last night, and prayed the two men's mercy. It was the very house they had attempted to rob. Oliver felt such fear come over him, when he recognised the place, that, for the instant, he forgot the agony of his wound, and thought only of flight. Flight! He could scarcely stand. And if he were in full possession of all the best powers of his slight and youthful frame, whither could he fly? He pushed against the garden gate. It was unlocked, and swung open on its hinges. He tottered across the lawn, climbed the steps, knocked faintly at the door, and, his whole strength failing him, sunk down against one of the pillows of the little portico. It happened that about this time Mr. Giles, Brittles, and the Tinker were recruiting themselves, after the fatigues and terrors of the night, with tea and sundries in the kitchen. Not that it was Mr. Giles's habit to admit to too great familiarity the humbler servants, towards whom it was rather his wont to deport himself with a lofty affability, which, while it gratified, could not fail to remind them of his superior position in society. But death, fires, and burglary make all men equals. So Mr. Giles sat with his legs stretched out before the kitchen fender, leaning his left arm on the table, while with his right he illustrated a circumstantial and minute account of the robbery, to which his bearers, but especially the cook and housemaid who were of the party, listened with breathless interest. "'It was about half-past two, said Mr. Giles, "'or I wouldn't swear that it mightn't have been a little nearer three when I woke up, and turning round in my bed, as it might be so—' Here Mr. Giles turned round in his chair, and pulled the corner of the tablecloth over him to imitate bedclothes. "'I fancied I heard a noise.' At this point of the narrative, the cook turned pale, and asked the housemaid to shut the door, who asked Brittles, who asked the tinker, who pretended not to hear. "'Hear the noise,' continued Mr. Giles. "'I says at first, this is illusion, and was composing myself off to sleep, when I heard the noise again, distinct.' "'What sort of a noise?' asked the cook. "'A kind of a busting noise.' replied Mr. Giles, looking round him. "'More like the noise of powdering an iron bar and a nutmeg grater,' suggested Brittles. "'It was when you heard it, sir,' rejoined Mr. Giles. "'But at this time it had a busting sound. I turned down the clothes,' continued Giles, rolling back the tablecloth, sat up in bed, and listened. The cook and housemaid simultaneously ejaculated, "'Law!' and drew their chairs closer together. "'I heard it now, quite apparent,' resumed Mr. Giles. "'Somebody,' I says, "'is forcing of a door or window. What's to be done? I'll call up that poor lad, Brittles, and save him from being murdered in his bed, or his throat, I says, may be cut from his right ear to his left without his ever knowing it." Here all eyes were turned upon Brittles, who fixed his upon the speaker, and stared at him with his mouth wide open, and his face expressive of the most unmitigated horror. "'I tossed off the clothes,' said Giles, throwing away the tablecloth, and looking very hard at the cook and housemaid, got softly out of bed, drew on a pair of ladies present, Mr. Giles,' murmured the tinker of shoes, sir," said Giles, turning upon him, and laying great emphasis on the word. 
seized the loaded pistol that always goes upstairs with the plate basket, and walked on tiptoes to his room. Bittles, I says, when I had woke him, don't be frightened. So you did, observed Brittles in a low voice. We're dead men, I think, Brittles, I says, continued Giles. But don't be frightened. Was he frightened? asked the cook. Not a bit of it, replied Mr. Giles. He was as firm, er, uh, pretty near as firm, as I was. I should have died at once, I'm sure, if it had been me, observed the housemaid. You're a woman, retorted Brittles, plucking up a little. Brittles is right, said Mr. Giles, nodding his head approvingly. From a woman, nothing else was to be expected. We, being men, took a dark lantern that was standing on Brittles' hob, and groped our way downstairs in the pitch dark, as it might be so. Mr. Giles had risen from his seat, and taken two steps with his eyes shut, to accompany his description with appropriate action, when he started violently, in common with the rest of the company, and hurried back to his chair. The cook and housemaid screamed. "'It was a knock,' said Mr. Giles, assuming perfect serenity. "'Open the door, somebody.' Nobody moved. "'It seems a strange sort of a thing, a knock coming at such a time in the morning,' said Mr. Giles, surveying the pale faces which surrounded him, and looking very blank himself. "'But the door must be opened. Do you hear? Somebody?' Mr. Giles, as he spoke, looked at Brittles. But that young man, being naturally modest, probably considered himself nobody, and so held that the inquiry could not have any application to him. At all events he tendered no reply. Mr. Giles directed an appealing glance at the tinker, but he had suddenly fallen asleep. The women were out of the question. "'If Brittles would rather open the door in the presence of witnesses,' said Mr. Giles, after a short silence, "'I am ready to make one.' "'So am I,' said the tinker, waking up, as suddenly as he had fallen asleep. Brittles capitulated on these terms, and the party being somewhat reassured by the discovery, made on throwing open the shutters, that it was now broad day, took their way upstairs, with the dogs in front. The two women, who were afraid to stay below, brought up the rear. By the advice of Mr. Giles, they all talked very loud, to warn any evil-disposed person outside that they were strong in numbers, and by a master-stoke of policy, originating in the brain of the same ingenious gentleman, the dogs' tails were well pinched in the hall to make them bark savagely. These precautions having been taken, Mr. Giles held on fast by the tinker's arm, to prevent his running away, as he pleasantly said, and gave the word of command to open the door. Brittles obeyed. The group peeping timorously over each other's shoulders, beheld no more formidable an object than poor little Oliver Twist, speechless and exhausted, who raised his heavy eyes, and mutely solicited their compassion. "'A boy!' exclaimed Mr. Giles, valiantly pushing the tinker into the background. "'What's the matter with the—' Eh? "'Why, Brittles, look here, don't you know?' Brittles, who had got behind the door to open it, no sooner saw Oliver than he uttered a loud cry. Mr. Giles, seizing the boy by one leg and one arm, fortunately not the broken limb, lugged him straight into the hall, and deposited him at full length on the floor thereof. "'Here he is!' bawled Giles, calling in a state of great excitement up the staircase. "'Here's one of the thieves, ma'am! Here's a thief, miss! Wounded, miss! I shot him, miss! And Brittles held the light!' "'In a lantern, miss,' cried Brittles, applying one hand to the side of his mouth, so that his voice might travel the better. The two women-servants ran upstairs to carry the intelligence that Mr. Giles had captured a robber, and the tinker busied himself in endeavouring to restore Oliver, lest he should die before he could be hanged. In the midst of all this noise and commotion, there was heard a sweet female voice, which quelled it in an instant. "'Giles?' whispered the voice from the stairhead. "'I'm here, miss,' replied Mr. Giles. "'Don't be frightened, miss. I ain't much injured. He didn't make a very desperate resistance, miss. I was soon too many for him.' "'Hush!' 
replied the young lady. "'You frightened my aunt as much as the thieves did. Is the poor creature much hurt?' "'Wounded desperate, miss,' replied Giles, with indescribable complacency. "'He looks as if he was a going, miss,' bawled Brittles in the same manner as before. "'Wouldn't you like to come and look at him, miss, in case he should?' "'Hush, pray, there's a good man,' rejoined the lady. "'Wait quietly only one instant, while I speak to aunt.' With a footstep as soft and gentle as the voice, the speaker tripped away. She soon returned, with the direction that the wounded person was to be carried carefully upstairs to Mr. Giles's room, and that Brittles was to saddle the pony, and betake himself instantly to Chertsey, from which place he was to dispatch with all speed a constable and doctor. "'But won't you take one look at him first, miss?' asked Mr. Giles, with as much pride as if Oliver were some bird of rare plumage that he had skilfully brought down. "'Not one little peep, miss?' "'Not now, for the world,' replied the young lady. "'Poor fellow! Oh, treat him kindly, Giles, for my sake!' The old servant looked up at the speaker as she turned away, with a glance as proud and admiring as if she had been his own child. Then, bending over Oliver, he helped to carry him upstairs with the care and solicitude of a woman. Chapter Twenty Nine has an introductory account of the inmates of the house to which Oliver resorted. In a handsome room, though its furniture had rather the air of old-fashioned comfort than of modern elegance, there sat two ladies at a well-spread breakfast-table. Mr. Giles, dressed with scrupulous care in a full suit of black, was in attendance upon them. He had taken his station some halfway between the sideboard and the breakfast-table, and, with his body drawn up to its full height, his head thrown back, and inclined the merest trifle on one side, his left leg advanced, and his right hand thrust into his waistcoat, while his left hung down by his side, grasping a waiter, looked like one who laboured under a very agreeable sense of his own merits and importance. Of the two ladies, one was well advanced in years, but the high-backed oaken chair in which she sat was not more upright than she. Dressed with the utmost nicety and precision, in a quaint mixture of bygone costume, with some slight concessions to the prevailing taste, which rather served to point the old style pleasantly than to impair its effect, she sat, in a stately manner, with her hands folded on the table before her. Her eyes, an age had dimmed but little of their brightness, were attentively upon her young companion. The younger lady was in the lovely bloom and springtime of womanhood. At that age, when if ever angels be for God's good purpose enthroned in mortal forms, they may be, without impiety, supposed to abide in such as hers. She was not past seventeen, cast in so slight and exquisite a mould, so mild and gentle, so pure and beautiful, that earth seemed not her element, nor its rough creatures her fit companions. The very intelligence that shone in her deep blue eyes, and was stamped upon her noble head, seemed scarcely of her age, or of the world. And yet the changing expression of sweetness and good humour, the thousand lights that played about the face, and left no shadow there, above all the smile, the cheerful, happy smile, were made for home and fireside peace and happiness. She was busily engaged in the little offices of the table. Chancing to raise her eyes as the elder lady was regarding her, she playfully put back her hair, which was simply braided on her forehead, and threw into her beaming look such an expression of affection and artless loveliness, that blessed spirits might have smiled to look upon her. "'And Brittles has been gone upwards of an hour, has he?' asked the old lady, after a pause. "'An hour and twelve minutes, ma'am,' replied Mr. Giles, referring to a silver watch, which he drew forth by a black ribbon. "'He is always slow,' remarked the old lady. "'Brittles always was a slow boy, ma'am,' replied the attendant, and seeing, by the by, that Brittles had been a slow boy for upwards of thirty years, there appeared no great probability of his ever being a fast one. "'He gets worse instead of better, I think,' said the elder lady. "'It is very inexcusable in him, if he stops to play with any other boys.' said the young lady, smiling. Mr. Giles was apparently considering the propriety of indulging in a respectful smile himself, 
when a gig drove up to the garden gate, out of which there jumped a fat gentleman who ran straight up to the door, and who, getting quickly into the house by some mysterious process, burst into the room, and nearly overturned Mr. Giles and the breakfast-table together. "'I never heard of such a thing!' exclaimed the fat gentleman. "'My dear Mrs. Maylie, bless my soul, in the silence of the night, too, I never heard of such a thing!' With these expressions of condolence, the fat gentleman shook hands with both ladies, and, drawing up a chair, inquired how they found themselves. "'You ought to be dead! Positively dead with the fright!' said the fat gentleman. "'Why didn't you send? Bless me! My man should have come in a minute, and so would I, and my assistant would have been delighted, or anybody, I'm sure, under such circumstances. Oh, dear, dear, so unexpected, in the silence of the night, too!" The doctor seemed especially troubled by the fact of the robbery having been unexpected and attempted in the night-time, as if it were the established custom of gentlemen in the housebreaking way to transact business at noon, and to make an appointment by post a day or two previous. "'And you, Miss Rose?' said the doctor, turning to the young lady. "'I—oh, very much so, indeed,' said Rose, interrupting him. "'But there is a poor creature upstairs, whom Aunt wishes you to see.' "'Ah, to be sure,' replied the doctor. "'So there is. That was your handiwork, Giles, I understand.' Mr. Giles, who had been feverishly putting the teacups to rights, blushed very red, and said that he had had that honour. "'Honour, eh?' said the doctor. "'Well, I don't know. Perhaps it's as honourable to hit a thief in a back kitchen as hit your man at twelve paces. Fancy that he fired in the air, and you've fought a duel, Giles.' Mr. Giles, who thought this light treatment of the matter an unjust attempt at diminishing his glory, answered respectfully that it was not for the like of him to judge about that, but he rather thought it was no joke to the opposite party. "'Gad! That's true,' said the doctor. "'Where is he? Show me the way.' I'll look in again as I come down, Mrs. Maylie. That's the little window that he got in at, eh? Well, I couldn't have believed it." Talking all the way, he followed Mr. Giles upstairs, and while he is going upstairs, the reader may be informed that Mr. Losburn, a surgeon in the neighbourhood, known through a circuit of ten miles round as the doctor, had grown fat more from good humour than from good living and was as kind and hearty, and withal as eccentric an old bachelor, as will be found in five times that space by any explorer alive. The doctor was absent much longer than either he or the ladies had anticipated. A large flat box was fetched out of the gig, and a bedroom bell was rung very often, and the servants ran up and down stairs perpetually, from which tokens it was justly concluded that something important was going on above. At length he returned and in reply to an anxious inquiry after his patient, looked very mysterious, and closed the door, carefully. "'This is a very extraordinary thing, Mrs. Maylie,' said the doctor, standing with his back to the door, as if to keep it shut. "'He is not in any danger, I hope,' said the old lady. "'Why, that would not be an extraordinary thing under the circumstances,' replied the doctor, "'though I don't think he is. Have you seen the thief?' No, rejoined the old lady, nor heard anything about him. No, I beg your pardon, ma'am, interposed Mr. Giles, but I was going to tell you about him when Dr. Losburn came in. The fact was that Mr. Giles had not, at first, been able to bring his mind to the avowal that he had only shot a boy. Such commendations had been bestowed upon his bravery that he could not, for the life of him, help postponing the explanation for a few delicious minutes, during which he had flourished in the very zenith of a brief reputation for undaunted courage. "'Rose wished to see the man,' said Mrs. Maylie, "'but I wouldn't hear of it.' Hm," rejoined the doctor. "'There's nothing very alarming in his appearance. Have you any objection to see him in my presence?' "'If it be necessary,' replied the old lady, "'certainly not.' "'Then I think it is necessary,' said the doctor. "'At all events, I am quite sure that you would deeply regret not having done so if you postponed it. He is perfectly quiet and comfortable now. Allow me, Miss Rose, will you permit me? Not the slightest fear. I pledge you my honour.' 